thank you everybody for coming. We're going to go and get started. So for everybody in the room and everybody online, I want to thank everybody for attending the uh, AIAA Hampton Road Section Young Professional Fall 2022 uh, Excellence Lecture. Uh, our speaker today is Michelle Banshee. Um, she is a friend of mine right downstairs in the kind of configuration arrow. And she's going to be talking about her research, which is on cross-flow attenuated natural laminar flow. Um, and particularly it's technology development from concept to flight. And to introduce Michelle, um, she's a research engineer uh, in the configuration aerodynamics branch at NASA Langley Research Center right here. Um, she received her honors, a bachelor of science in aerospace engineering from UT at Arlington um, and her master's of science in engineering from uh, the University of Michigan. Her research is primarily focused on aircraft design methods to improve aerodynamic performance and has led computational development and experimental evaluation of a new laminar flow wing design method, which is going to be talking about today. It's referred to as the cross flow attenuated natural laminar flow method. Um, and uh, most importantly, Michelle is the recipient of the 2023 AIAA Hampton Road Section Robert Mitchell Tree Young Engineer of uh, Young Engineer of the Year Award. So congratulations, Michelle. Almost didn't get that out. Um, and um, before I turn things over to Michelle, just a note about um, the award itself. Um, the award comes from, uh, to honor uh, Robert Mitchell Tree, also known as Bob Mitchell Tree, who um, I unfortunately, you know, came in after he had already passed away, um, but was a really prolific individual. He attended my alma mater and worked in my branch, actually, at NC State University and the Air Thermodynamics branch um, here at NASA Langley. He started as a co-op back in 1983 and shortly thereafter found his calling uh, in planetary atmospheric entry systems design, uh, working with the uh, JPL folks and his contributions um, to the planetary exploration missions was really immense. He did a lot of design and development of not only the Mars Pathfinder, the Mars microprobes, Stardust, Genesis capsules, um, sample return capsules, and uh, many other missions as well. And uh, Bobby Braun, who many of you may be familiar with um, at Georgia Tech, um, he was one of Bob's closest friends and collaborators, had this to say about Bob. Bob taught us that elegance, grace, and simplicity are key facets of design and of a successful life. He taught us that the problems cannot be solved until stripped down to their root cause. He taught us that if you listen carefully, the laws of physics will speak to you. And he taught us that the hardest engineering challenges are at the interfaces of traditional disciplines. Bob demonstrated each of these lessons by example in the way he carried himself, lived his life, committed with others, his commitment communicated with others, and in the manner in which he approached difficult engineering challenges. So it's truly an honor to be able to uh, award Michelle the award that's named after him. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and hopefully. That is a fantastic note. <laughs> I know how I'm gonna fix this because I'm gonna get out of this one right here. Well, sorry for those online. I hope my notes were useful to you. <laughs> All right. You know, I feel like I'm committed at this point. <laughs> well, now the computer made the choice for me. This is why Michelle got the award and I didn't. <laughs> All right. So this time around, let's see if we can do that. And if anybody's online, particularly maybe Brett, if you can tell us if the slideshow looks correct now, it should be a full screen with the full title page. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
I'm going to assume that was successful. And if not, then we will uh, we'll course correct there. But let me get that back. It wasn't. It's not. What does it look like to them? Do you want to just do a share screen on the Zoom? Yep. And we'll just share the whole. Yep. Entire screen. Oh no, oh no, there we go. Okay, how about now for those online? Well, maybe actually. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Exactly. I'm glad you understand machine. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Take it away. Thanks, Thanks. Michelle. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, as Kyle mentioned, my name is Michelle Banshee, formerly Lined, and today I'll be talking about the cross-flow attenuated natural laminar flow, or CAD NLF, uh, technology development process from concept to flight. This research was conducted by myself and my two coworkers, Dick Campbell and Brett Hiller. So today in the presentation, I will start with a background and motivation to cover uh, why we started this research. I'll then go into the CAD NLF technology development um, covering the computational study, the wind tunnel test, and the flight test. Um, I'll quickly go over what we're doing now and what we plan on doing next, and then wrap up with a summary. So before I jump into the technical detail of what our research um, is focused on, I wanted to provide some context into why we're doing this research, starting first with what even is laminar flow. So as most of you know, laminar and turbulent just describes the state of the boundary layer, which is the fluid very near the surface. And um, while laminar flow may be more difficult to uh, maintain, it is desirable on vehicles because it's known to improve the performance of the vehicle, specifically by reducing both skin friction and profile drag. And to um, kind of quantify that statement a little bit more, I did go ahead and add some um, numbers associated with a, uh, just as an example of what laminar flow can buy you on a vehicle. So for a 777 type aircraft with laminar flow on the main wing, um, we're looking at a potential fuel burn savings of on the order of five to 10%. So a pretty substantial uh, potential for this technology. Um, so this chart here is just kind of going over um, some potential applications of laminar flow on a vehicle. Um, some of these are harder than others. For our research specifically, we're looking at laminar flow on the main wing. And when you're trying to get laminar flow on the main wing, there are specific challenges that you need to overcome. So um, the challenges typically are associated with the fact that for a transport aircraft, in order to reach the desired cruise speed, you typically have to sweep back the main wing. And that will lead to four primary mechanisms of transition. The first and most critical is attachment line transition, which is when the turbulent fuselage uh, boundary layer runs onto the leading edge of the swept wing causing the attachment line of the wing to be turbulent and leading to a total loss of laminar flow. Next, we have cross flow transition, which um, occurs or grows uh, when you increase the sweep or the Reynolds number of the component. And it typically will grow very near the leading edge and lead to leading edge transition. After that, we have Tolmich lifting transition, which is uh, a boundary layer instability that grows in response to adverse pressure gradients, which are typically found in the mid cord region of a wing. Um, so it will typically lead to mid cord transition. And then finally, we have um, bypass transition, which are basically little localized trips, which are due to surface imperfections. And those will cause uh, turbulent wedges that will emanate from the surface imperfection. So of these four mechanisms of transition um, that we're looking at, the most critical is by far attachment line transition because it does lead to a total loss in laminar flow. However, it is fairly well understood and there are reasonable ways to address attachment line transition by introducing a gastro bump or gastro slot to divert that um, fuselage boundary layer away from the leading edge. So the next most critical would then be cross flow transition, which is really what we're working on um, for our method. Historically, there have been two primary methods to address cross-flow transition. The first is to simply reduce the wing sweep, because as I mentioned, it does grow with increasing sweep. Um, however, when you want to reduce the sweep of a wing, you typically do require to fly slower. Um, so that is a trade that airliners are not always willing or able to make. Um, the next option for cross-flow is to introduce a flow control system, such as suction. And those are known um, to successfully re uh, reduce cross flow. 
However, they do typically increase the weight complexity or cost of the vehicle. So far, neither option have really bought their way onto um, commercial transports. So that's really what led us to begin our research where we're looking to obtain that laminar flow on the primary wing without these historic penalties. So as they mentioned, the, the work we're um, working towards is CAD and LF. And at its core, CAD and LF is a design method um, that where we are changing the shape of the wing airfoils in order to obtain very specific pressure distributions, thank you, um, to, that are known to control cross flow instabilities. This work um, started back in 2014 and we've developed it in three phases. The first was a computational study where we were really working to understand and develop the technology and help quantify its performance potential. Um, after that, we led a wind tunnel test um, with the hopes to confirm those computations. And then um, now we're currently working on a flight test effort. So I'm gonna walk through each one of these phases in, individually and kind of talk about what we learned from each one. So for the computational study, uh, we used a wide range of computational tools. Um, the first and most important is the CDISC design module. CDISC is a knowledge-based um, tool that basically works by changing the geometry of your, in this case, wing, in order to obtain target pressure distributions. CDISC is coupled with a flow solver. We most commonly use the USM 3D flow solver. And then in addition to our design module and flow solver, we need a way to computationally predict where transition would occur. So we use the boundary layer profile solver, BLSTA 3D, coupled with the last track boundary layer stability analysis code. Within last track, we are using E to the N method with linear stability theory, and we do include compressibility effects. So as I mentioned, CDISC is a pretty important part of this process. So I wanted to quickly give an example of what um, I mean when I say it's knowledge-based design. Um, so what we're looking at here is a slice of the wing. It's mid-span. You can see where we are on the wing in the top left-hand uh, little airplane. <laughs> and um, on the left plot, we're looking at the pressure distribution. And on the right is the airfoil shape. Both plots, the blue solid line is the baseline. So that's the geometry and pressures that were provided to us for this design. And then the red um, dashed lines are the designs that are coming out of CDISC. On the pressures, you'll also see black squares, which are labeled as targets. That's the target pressure distribution that CDISC automatically comes up with. And that is basically um, the way CDISC works is it provides a pressure distribution with knowledge built in that is known to have better performance. So in this specific case, we're looking at reducing this shock um, and altering the pressure distribution to help us do that. So as I begin the movie, um, as the design cycles progress, um, you can see that we are changing both the shape and orientation of the airfoils, which are leading to new pressures. Um, and as the design matures and gets closer and closer to being done, which I think in this case is 50 cycles, uh, by the end, we should see a new airfoil shape that provides the targets, uh, or the actual target pressures that we were looking for. Um, and we can proceed on from here with that better flow. <laughs> so that was an example of just the, the CDISC process. Um, this talk is obviously spoke, focused specifically on laminar flow. Um, so I want to walk through the laminar flow pressure distributions. Um, in this case, the blue is a sample turbulent and the red are our cat and left pressures. And I've highlighted some notable differences both in text and by the arrows. So starting first at the leading edge, you can see a very notable difference in the acceleration. Um, for the laminar pressure distributions, we are accelerating the flow very quickly um, and then going into like a corner in that pressure is that followed by an almost constant CP gradient. That change in acceleration really is the key feature for CAD and LF. That's what's controlling the cross flow instabilities at the leading edge. After that feature, we've introduced a mild favorable pressure gradient that's to control trauma lifting. And because we've changed that gradient, you can see that there is a difference in the shock strength where the laminar flow typically does have a slightly stronger shock than the turbulent flow, which is a known um, trade-off or penalty for laminar flow. So I'm gonna walk through just an example of one of our computational studies now. So on the left, we're looking at an inboard station on the right is outboard. This time the blue solid line is a turbulent wing and the red dashed line is our cat and left wing. So in general, um, these pressure distributions, you can see a lot of the key features I pointed out before, namely that rapid acceleration at the leading edge, followed by a near constant pressure gradient. And 
And as we're talking a lot about Crossflow, this chart's gonna walk through specifically what's changing with Crossflow. So for both of these plots, the y-axis is crossflow and factor growth, so just a measure of crossflow in the boundary layer. And there is that horizontal dashed line, which represents the critical end factor. So anytime the line crosses or exceeds the critical end factor, the flow is considered transitioned. So as you can see with the turbulent wing, um, due to the sweep and Reynolds number of the component, the crossflow grows extremely rapidly at the leading edge. That is expected. Um, we would see basically leading edge transition at the inboard station, maybe a couple percent outboard where it crosses that dashed line. For the kind of left wing, due to the pressures that we've introduced, we do still have crossflow, so we aren't eliminating it entirely, but we do suppress it such that it never exceeds that critical end factor. And we can say that there is no crossflow transition on this wing at these conditions. Similarly, we can look at the Tolmich lifting growth within the boundary layer. This time, our primary um, design uh, desire, I guess, is to delay the growth or alter the shape of the Tolmich lifting growth such that we can pull the transition location further back on the airfoil. So you can see, especially inboard, comparing the blue to the red, that we've altered the shape of the curve to be able to extend the laminar flow back to about 60%. And finally, um, this plot here shows the airfoil changes that were needed to obtain those pressure distributions. In general, the main takeaway is that our kettle left airfoils still look like airfoils. We aren't having to go to drastically different shapes in order to get these laminar flow pressure distributions. The primary difference you'll see for a cat and airfoil um, is typically in the leading edge region. And you can see it most notably here on the inboard where we have gone to a smaller leading edge radius that is needed to help us accelerate the flow at the leading edge to help suppress that cross flow. And it does also help with attachment line transition. So kind of zooming out a little bit, a little higher picture, higher level picture of um, laminar flow characteristics on this wing. Um, so what we're looking at here is what's called a transition front where the light gray is laminar and the dark gray is turbulent. And basically just visualizes that um, on this wing, the cat and left method enabled 56% laminar flow on the wing upper surface. That did lead to a 7% drag reduction compared to the turbulent wing at this condition. And in order to put the cat and left method in perspective to um, previous or historic methods, we typically will look at this plot and I'm gonna walk through it a little slower because it's a little confusing at times and we'll revisit it several times. So the y-axis here is laminar flow extent measured in transition Reynolds number and the x-axis is leading edge wing sweep. Um, all these blue dots here are just historic NLF experiments, so that includes both wind tunnel and flight tests. I'm drawing your attention to one corner of the plot because that's the kind of range of sweeps that we're typically looking at for this um, mock and, and class of vehicles. And you'll notice that all of the blue dots tend to be clustered on one portion of the plot. So we do typically add this green, um, notional boundary that we call the historic boundary for natural laminar flow. So basically anything below that green line, um, you can typically use classical methods to obtain natural laminar flow. If you wanna go beyond that green line, you do need to start introducing historically flow control like suction to help address cross flow. So adding in our computational results using the cat and left method, um, you can see that it would far expand the um, historical boundary for natural laminar flow technology um, utilizing this technology. So with the um, positive results from that computational study, we went ahead and started the wind tunnel tests with the primary objective of confirming the computations. So the test uh, was completed here at Langley uh, in October of 2018 in the National Transonic Facility or NTF. And for those who aren't as familiar with the NTF, it is a pressurized cryogenic wind tunnel. And our primary reason for choosing the NTF for this experiment was because of its capabilities to obtain flight Reynolds numbers, which is extremely relevant for uh, laminar flow data. So the model was designed using the CATNLF method, um, and we call the model the Common Research Model with Natural Laminar Flow, or CRMNLF. Um, it was a 5.2% scale semi-span model. You can see a picture of it here mounted on the sidewall of the NTF. Um, its summary span length was just over 60 inches and the reference cord was just over a foot. During the test, we acquired um, surface pressure transition visualization um, data and those were the two most um, utilized sources of data. We also got force and moment data and model deformation data during the test. 
I've listed the primary test conditions. The primary, the, the key takeaway though from that table is just that we changed temperature during the test in order to vary Reynolds number on the model and we stuck around that near cruise test conditions. So we've talked a lot about pressure so far. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do when we got into the tunnel or started getting data back was confirm that our pressures were what we needed them to be. Since the catalyst method is purely uh, a pressure architecture strategy, we needed to make sure we got that in the tunnel. So what we're looking at here is the uh, computations, which is the red line uh, compared to the wind tunnel data, which are the black symbols. And in general, this is the type of agreement we saw during the test. So pretty great agreement with computations. And most importantly, looking specifically at the wind tunnel data, you can see all the key features of the cannon left method. So we do see the rapid acceleration followed by a near constant pressure gradient. So this has confirmed that the model we were testing was um, good enough to start evaluating the, the specific cannon left method. So as I mentioned, um, the other key source of data during the test was transition visualization. So what we're looking at here is a temperature sensitive paint image. So it's actually the upper surface of the wing in the test where the light region is laminar and the dark region is turbulent. I've added that yellow dashed line, which we call the wind tunnel front, just for your eyes to visualize a little bit easier where the transition location was in the wind tunnel. And then I overlaid that with our pretest computational front. You can see across the span that we have pretty good agreement between what we expected to see in the tunnel and what we actually saw. So to us, this was nice initial confirmation that the CAD and LF assumption tools and design methods were valid. Revisiting um, this plot here, we can now add in the CRM and LF in the NTF. We closed that symbol because it is an experimental data now instead of computational predictions. Um, and you can see at comparable sweeps, the NTF data was um, nearly double any historic um, natural laminar flow experiment. So that was exciting to see for sure and confirm that we're, uh, we're addressing the crosswind instabilities, which were normally the key feature of that um, sweep. You may notice, however, that it is quite a bit lower than the first star I showed. Um, and the primary reason for that is because of difficulties associated with acquiring high Reynolds number data, for specifically high Reynolds number laminar data in a one channel environment. And that's um, challenging for two reasons. The first is the environment. Uh, typically, wind tunnels do have a higher turbulence level um, than flight, which will bring the, the laminar front forward naturally. And then we do also struggle with model size due to the, the physical constraints of being in a tunnel. We've had to size down the model quite a bit, as I mentioned, and um, that really thins the boundary layer and makes bypass transition uh, a challenge at high Reynolds numbers. But um, the positive results we did see so far of going beyond that boundary was enough motivation for us to pursue flight testing, which will hopefully alleviate some of the challenges we saw in the test, in the wind tunnel test. So now we can move on to the flight test, which is what we're working on now. So our flight test is actually a series of three different flight tests. They are all in collaboration with Armstrong Flight Research Center, and we are utilizing their F-15 CLIP or Centerline Instrumented Pylon uh, flight test bed. So we basically the way that the clip works is that a customer can come in, build a test article, made it with the, the clip under the F-15 and the F-15 will fly it around. You can acquire data on the test article during flight. So for our flight test series, we have three separate test articles. The first is called Reheat. Um, that was basically a, a proof of technology to help us improve the laminar flow detection in flight. That was successfully flown in 2019 and then a, a little bit in early 2020 as well. After reheat, we are doing a flow rake experiment. That is a um, flow rake with the goal to quantify the environment under the F-15. As I just got finished talking about, the environment for laminar flow testing is um, very important. So this test is um, set out to better understand that environment um, so that way we can interpret our, our test data better. That uh, test article is manufactured and it's awaiting flight for next year. I think it's late spring right now. And then um, our final test is the Cadden LF stub wing test. That is our primary experiment. And that is the, the Cadden LF um, main piece. And that should be done in um, next year as well. 
So going into a little bit more detail on the Canada Left test itself, um, I put some key parameters up there, but you can see at the, the top one, the mean aerodynamic cord, we were able to maximize that to a 5.9 um, foot cord. For reference, back in the wind tunnel, we were just over a foot at 14 inches. So we were able to significantly increase the cord of our test article, which should help us um, with that high Reynolds number data. You'll notice, however, the span is only a little over three feet. Um, that's because the airplane still has to be able to take off and land. Um, so it does make a really small aspect ratio for a test article, which led to some interesting design features or challenges. Um, but uh, we call it stubby because of its small aspect ratio. <laughs> um, and then the next couple parameters are just kind of highlighting that we're still in that um, transonic transport wing classification for the design conditions. While we were doing this design, we had two primary goals in mind. The first obviously was to focus on CAD and LF and gather data to confirm its effectiveness, specifically in controlling crossflow. And then the secondary uh, goal was to begin to acquire data to investigate surface finish requirements for laminar applications um, for airliners as well. So this kind of gives the highest level of laminar flow characteristics on this tunnel. There's, I mean, on this test article, there are um, a bunch of other design considerations and stuff in the paper, but this is just going to highlight that we were able to design the test article to um, support 53% laminar flow on the section side of the test article. And we've changed that front to kind of excite or control different mechanisms of transition at different locations to help us gather data. During the flight, um, we plan on selecting flight conditions to help us gather data for our goals. Um, I listed them here, but again, the primary takeaway is that this time we're gonna change altitude in order to vary the Reynolds number on the test article during the flight test to acquire data at a wide range of Reynolds numbers. We've also instrumented the test article itself to help us um, gather as much data as possible to understand the method. So our primary data source will be transition images. This time we'll be using an IR camera that's mounted to the F-15 wing and viewing the suction side of the test article. Um, we do also have a bunch of pressure sensors, which is our secondary sense set of data. Um, as I mentioned, pressure is pretty important for this method. Uh, what we see here on the right-hand side is the pressure side of the test article with the cover plates removed. So you can see the, the amount of instrumentation we have in the model. Um, so hopefully with this test article being as instrumented as it is, we'll be able to gather a lot of data to help us understand the method. And back to um, our chart to pull it back into perspective compared to uh, historic NLF approaches. Um, so this test article is predicted to um, significantly expand back up to um, the flight relevant um, Reynolds numbers and laminar flow extent. So we're hoping to get as close to that star as possible within the limitations of um, practical flight testing. So moving on to what we're doing now and what we plan on doing. Um, right now, we're obviously still working on the flight test. So the test article has been manufactured and delivered, which is very exciting. It is currently actually here at Langley. Um, it's here not for much longer, but we're just painting it here and finishing instrumenting before we ship it off to Armstrong to begin integration into their F-15. Um, we do currently have the timeline set for June of 23, so fingers crossed that that still happens. <laughs> Flight testing, as I'm sure many of you know, is subject to a lot. <laughs> Um, and then uh, for future work after the flight test, we do hope to release this, uh, the flight test data to the community. We did something similar for the CRM and LF and saw a lot of positive um, interactions and growth in the computational prediction uh, community. So we're hoping to do something similar there. And then we also have a potential follow on wind tunnel test where we would take this test article and actually put it in a wind tunnel in order to get uh, laminar flow data on the same test article in two different environments to help us kind of study environmental impact on laminar flow. So um, kind of concluding quickly, um, today we talked a lot about laminar flow. Um, it's known to have a lot of uh, per potential performance improvements, um, but it has been limited in practical applications for the main wing, primarily due to cross flow instabilities. So we developed the CAD and LF method. Um, and today I talked about the three different phases we developed it in, starting with the computational study, which was to develop 
and understand the, the technology, the wind tunnel test to confirm the computations, and then the flight test to help us advance the technology further. Um, the flight test is scheduled for June of 23, and we're hoping to release that data and do a potential wind tunnel test follow on as well. So that is all I have. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question, I don't know if how easy it is to hear on, online. The question was uh, kind of two. The first was, does the test article carry any lift? The answer to that is yes. Um, our, uh, it is loaded to a sectional lift of about 0.5, which is the same of a transonic wing, uh, or at least at these uh, Mach numbers. So it is a, a loaded test article. So we're producing a lot of side force because it's a fin on the F-15. So that is one of the, uh, when I said practical uh, limitations on flight testing, that is one of them. Um, because the lower we go in altitude, the more side force we're gonna get by when we increase the queue. So um, the pilots are working now on simulators and figuring out how they need to fly it in order to counteract that side force. Um, the second question was a question related to the span and how that affected crossflow growth. Um, Is there enough span to really develop a crossflow that you I assume that's what you're trying to mitigate. Yes, yeah, it is. So there was definitely enough cross flow on the original. <laughs> um, the span is limited. Our primary challenge with this, the span being so limited was actually the fact that the majority of the wing was either in tip or root effects. So we had very limited span to actually look at like what would be the majority of a normal wing <laughs> um, where you're, you could actually study, you know, TS uh, and have a more normal pressure gradient. Um, so we did a lot of design features to pull the tip shocks away from the laminar flow region, but we definitely still get cross flow due to the sweep and Reynolds number on it. Yep. The, um, if this is successful, it'd be awesome, by the way, because like airlines do anything for an extra like 1% of fuel burn right now. Mm -hmm. The um, two questions I had, I noticed one of the big features was a smaller leading edge radius. Mm -hmm. And normally one of the challenges of that is you lose CL max. So you'd have to take off and land at a higher speed. Is that something in the tool to like, as you change the airflow shape to make sure you still meet the same takeoff and landing field length? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so to repeat the question, <laughs> uh, the question was specifically about uh, the impact of the smaller leading edge radius on um, CL max at takeoff and landing. Um, so that definitely is a concern. That's one that is, gets brought up um, a lot. We do assume um, that you would have a leading edge device on the wing. Uh, specifically, we're looking at Kruger devices, so that way you can keep the upper surface of the wing a free of steps and gaps, so the Kruger will deploy entirely from the lower edge, lower surface. So the leading edge that the flow would actually see at takeoff and landing could be defined by the Kruger instead of by the cruise condition airfoil. So that should help. Um, there are still practical limitations in terms of being able to fit a Kruger in a smaller leading edge radius and questions about um, if the smaller leading edge radius, even on a second component, like behind a Kruger would somehow adversely impact the um, CL max. At this point, we haven't like gone to that depth of design um, because we're, we are assuming that there will be a, a high lift device there that we haven't you know, designed around. Cool. Thank you. You answered my second question about the leading edge device. Would I guess that means you get no laminar flow on the lower surface then because the Kruger flat? Yeah, so the question is about the lower surface laminar flow extent. We do um, eliminate laminar flow for, for our studies on the lower surface. We've seen a lot of people kind of assume you can get it on both. I guess if you went something towards something like a morphable leading edge, you could potentially in, increase the amount of surface area. At this point, we're kind of saying that technology isn't quite ready for uh, practical applications. So we're assuming you're gonna need a leading edge device and, and we've chosen to put laminar flow on the upper surface because that gives you the, the most performance benefit between the two. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brent? Got two questions. Um, first of all, you look at how you can really straighten the aspect ratio. What happened to the commercial airline Growing aspect ratios and then composites that are super flexible. How 
sensitive to this kind of design to um, not insignificant air elastic deformations. Yeah, so the question is about sensitivity to air elastic de deflections for a um, high aspect ratio like normal wing rather than this little stubby guy. Um, so I can't speak specifically to air elastic de deflection because that's not something we typically include in our CFD. We do assume a rigid wing. However, I think you could couple it with an air elastic method if you got to that level of design and predict what the deformation would be under load and design it such that under load, it would hit the right uh, pressure distributions. I'm assuming that's a challenge for any design, design, not just turbulence. As soon as you start deflecting the wing, you've got to still maintain good performance. So while we're specifically looking at laminar flow, I don't think that's a unique challenge to laminar flow as much as it is just accommodating off design conditions. We have looked at off design conditions with the laminar flow wing um, and seen that it does maintain laminar flow at near cruise conditions, which we typically assume is plus or minus 10% of your desired lift. Um, but the, the, I can't like speak to any specific data about including uh, air elastic effects. Uh, let's say you stick this on a triple set. Mm -hmm. How big of a bug do you have to have? Um, okay, so the question was, um, if we put this on a triple seven, how big of a bug does do we need to uh, before it starts falling apart? And the, the reason he's asking about bugs is because that'll basically form a uh, surface imperfection that's a localized trip. Um, I don't have the number <laughs> off the top of my head of, of what the, the dimensional boundary layer thickness is on a uh, triple seven is, uh, but it's definitely something to consider. I mean, I know there's a lot of research going into how to prevent accumulation of bug strikes um, or ice for that matter. And I think I'm looking at Jenna because Jenna does a lot of research on um, specifically like studying the amount of tolerance a laminar boundary layer can, can uh, have with uh, this kind of imperfection. So someone like Jenna might be able to answer your question a little better than me. But yeah, yeah, that's true. So the Kruger flap may be able to prevent or protect a little bit. Um, I'm not entirely sure if bugs care. Like, I guess I would think it was mostly just surf frontal surface area. So as if the Kruger doesn't cover all of it, it might still impact the, the main wing. But I have no actual knowledge on that. So. <laughs> Well, the bugs will hit the stagnation points. Okay. There's a stagnation point on the main element, and the bugs probably shouldn't hit. Okay. Well, then we're good. We don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yep. Uh, one of the purposes of natural laminar flow is eliminate the weight of flow control, but now you've got to include the weight of a Kruger. Mm -hmm. Have you made a trade study on, on those weights? Are you better off with a Kruger or a flow control? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I haven't actually heard that a Kruger is much worse than a, a traditional flap. So um, haven't gotten that feedback before, but that's definitely something to consider. I think we typically call this method like an enabling technology so people can do those trades and kind of decide if it's something that they want to pursue. Um, but yeah, the, there is a lot of other things that like, you know, we're not done here. There's a lot of things that kind of lead to um, making this more practical for airliners. Sally? Hi, Ms. Your transition miles number uh, slide. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, I know the chart moved over and down a little bit. Is that due to you didn't have as much sweep and then your limitations from what you could do in the test? Yes. So um, the question was why the star, the purple star moved um, down into the left for uh, this design versus the previous computational study star I showed. Um, so um, yes, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, for the wing sweep, we, we did define the wing sweep ourselves. Uh, we went with 35 degrees. The original CRM was 37.3. I think we just went with 35 because it was an easier number <laughs> um, to work with. But um, in terms of the extent, I mean, that really was maximized as much as we could get. Again, we did struggle quite a bit with um, impinging shocks from the root and tip and limiting the extent to laminar flow. Um, but in general, that that is, um, I think that star is based off of a shock limited uh, transition front inboard. Um, so it's uh, 
as much as we could get. In terms of Reynolds number, we were up to the design point, which is what this represents, is 31 million. So that is um, pretty good for a uh, an actual airplane, but we can't, we can only fly so low. <laughs> um, so we were limited in uh, the maximum Reynolds number we can get both due to, you know, altitude limitations as well as um, side force limitations on the, the test article. Mm -hmm. so I have the I'm a CFP developer, so I have the obligatory CFP questions. Um, could you um, walk me through the um, uh, design process real quickly? I think if I understand it correctly, the disc is driving the shape control. Mm -hmm. USM 3D is providing pressure, distri uh, pressure distribution last track and one other code, BL, BLST, yeah. um, are providing the um, stability theory component of this and the transition off there. And then that goes around in the loop. So when you're doing the animation, that's the process. The question I had as far as the design process goes, is that um, kind of tightly coupled to the US3D flow solver and the last track flow solver? Or is it amenable to lots of CFD codes and be generalized to mm -hmm. other codes out at NASA? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so to summarize, he's asking <laughs> for um, kind of just an explanation of what the loop is for the design process computationally, um, and then how widely uh, expandable it is to other flow solvers. So the first piece of that is the loop itself. Um, your description was correct uh, to some extent. We actually have two separate loops. So right now, there's the design loop, which feeds the flow solver to CDISC. Um, CDIS will take the current analysis pressures and the geometry pressures. It'll perturb the grid and then feed it back into the flow solver and get a new analysis pressures. And so that is cyclical. The example I showed had 50 cycles. Um, the last track, which is our computational uh, approach to predicting transition, is actually a separate loop right now. Um, we've found that it increases computational time to try to include it with the actual design process without much benefit, because typically by the end of a design, we are getting close to our target pressures. So we can go into the design assuming that the target pressures are a decent representation of the laminar flow extent we would see, and by the end of the design, we are that is like a reasonable assumption. And then of course we check at the end. Um, so right now the last track piece is separate from that loop specifically. Uh, in reference to, can you, you know, couple it with something else, CDISC itself is what has the CADNLF method in it. So you definitely need CDISC in order to use the method. Um, however, CDISC is uh, modular so you can loop it in with other flow solvers. We do, um, well, Brett Hiller actually spent a, a decent amount of time coupling it with uh, Fun3D, so it's coupled with that right now. And then in the past, we've done it a handful of other um, codes as well. Mm -hmm. Are there any online? I don't know. Brett said he's been monitoring and there are no questions. Okay. Maybe, um, people put it in Oh, can you, if anyone has any questions, can you put it in the chat? Because Kyle says we're having issues with the audio. <laughs> understand or there's no no questions, and that's fine, too. <laughs> that's so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is the Langley team, specifically. We've got a larger group at Armstrong who are great and unfortunately not in this photo. Um, <laughs> Um, but starting on the, the left, we've got our pink team. So that's led by Neil Watkins uh, and then Sarah Peak and Kyle Goodman. Um, and then in the back row, we have Lewis Owens. He's um, our expert uh, flow control person and our translator to all things boundary layer. <laughs> um, next to him is Dick Campbell, who is the um, co on the Cat and Left development um, and wrote CDISC. Um, behind me in the photo is Danny, um, and then next to him is Tom Hall. I can't remember, Don, Danny Levito, Le, I think. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Danny and Tom, um, and they are instrumentation specialists. So uh, while it's here at Langley, we're putting in the uh, very sensitive instrumentation um, for uh, dynamic pressure sensors, and that's what's the green tape on the model or uh, covering over the sensors right now because they're extremely sensitive to touch. So trying to protect them as much as possible, but. For the F-15 test, can you get cameras on it to do pressure sensitive paint? That's a good question. I don't know if they've done pressure sensitive paint. Um, they have a, a uh, 
pod on the wing with an IR camera. So it's, we are using uh, cameras for to visualize the laminate flow here, but um, we aren't doing pressure sensitive paint. I don't think they're like compatible at the same time. We care mostly about transition information. Um, I don't actually know that, but, um, but I, I don't know if they've ever done pressure sensitive paint on the um, F-15. I've never used pressure sensitive paint before, so um, yeah. And Jeff just said that it sounds like the reason there are no questions in the chat is because we accidentally disabled the chat. For some ah. <laughs> okay, well, apparently we disabled the chat. <laughs> well, fixing that, it sounds like the Q&A, um, the Q&A button does work. And I'm asking Brad if there's anything in there. Yeah, well, appreciate everyone's patience. I know um, this is the first time we're doing a hybrid uh, technical excellence lecture. Um, Kyle and Brett are doing a great job. <laughs> so. Quick question. Mm -hmm. So this isn't my area of expertise, but I'm curious what the IR camera gives you uh, when you're analyzing the image. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, for laminar flow detection, one of the, the ways we can visualize it is by exploiting the fact that there is a heat transfer difference between laminar and turbulent. So um, in general, laminar has much less mixing, um, so the heat transfer rate is lower. So typically we can excite a uh, temperature gradient um, and then visualize the temperature on the surface and see that the turbulent is equalizing faster than the laminar due to the change in um, mixing. Uh, so the IR, basically the, um, the black paint we actually see here, which was um, done by the, the paint team, has a um, resistive coating in it and you can apply current to it and it'll heat the wing. Um, and that is enough to excite that temperature gradient within the two different boundary layer states so that you can look at it with an IR camera, which gives you temperature on the surface and then it'll like show you the laminar regions. And that was a similar technique we used in the uh, wind tunnel. Although in that case, we used temperature sensitive paint instead of an IR camera, just due to the conditions we were at. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, I realized I forgot to repeat the last question, but the new question <laughs> is um, how often we're having to excite the temperature gradient um, in order to visualize laminar flow. Um, we, in the wind tunnel, did it every point. Um, so we used two different temperature methods, temperature gradient methods in the wind tunnel. One was the, the heating layer, uh, where you're heating the surface of the wing. The second was actually to introduce a rapid injection of liquid nitrogen, which is really cold. So we would like, basically cool down the free stream uh, really quickly. So you can do it either way. We did do it at every point. Um, and so basically every, uh, in the wind tunnels, every angle of attack, so we would move the wing and then we would sit there and hit slug it with the cold air or, or heating layer and then take a picture. Um, I'm assuming it'll be something similar here. The, the challenge or difference with the, the flight test is that um, we don't have like a steady state. Like we can't just set it to two degrees angle of attack and go. <laughs> like we're flying. So I think it'll be a lot more um, fluctuating in some sense where we'll, we'll try to get on point and hold point as the pilots will hold point as best as they can, and then we'll turn on the heating layer and keep the IR camera on, like recording throughout. Um, and then we'll post-process the data to extract specific points that correlate to conditions of interest. I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming and please enjoy your opening for the web. Otherwise, you'll see it. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>